Thank okay. you. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Super. So we are on time, on track to the um, our quick break session, but I think we're going to make use of the break session for our sponsor. We appreciate uh, Waterfall Security Solution uh, for sponsoring this workshop along with Duke Energy. And um, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Andrew Ginter, who is the Vice President for Industrial Security, uh, who is going to give an overview about Waterfall. And um, Andrew leads a team of experts who are who work with world's most secure industrial ent enterprises. Before Waterfall, he led development of high-end industrial control system products at Hewlett Packard of IT and OT middleware products at Agilin Technologies, one of the world's first industrial SAM at Industrial Defender. Andrew is the author of three books on industrial OT security, cybersecurity, a co-author of Industrial Internet Security Framework, and a co-author of the UITP report on cybersecurity requirements in rail system tendering. He co-hosts the Industrial Security Podcast and contributes regularly to Industrial Security Standards and Best Practice Guidelines. Andrew, thank you so much for joining. I think, can you hear me? The floor I can. Is... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Good. Yeah, thank you so much. That That's a long introduction. Maybe maybe the next time I'll give you a much shorter one. <laughs> um, but let me uh, share my screen here real quick. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so um, I'm I'm happy to uh, you know waterfalls happy to support uh, initiatives like like you're doing here. Um, you know, uh, part of my job at waterfalls to get the word out about industrial cybersecurity, about the big picture, about why OT security is important, about how OT security is different from uh, you know what what everybody learns about IT security everywhere else. Um, let me spend just a couple of minutes um, sort of giving you some of the latest thinking in the space. The latest thinking uh, is sort of is reflected by, uh, I, I think it's captured by an initiative from Idaho National Labs that is funded by uh, the U.S. Department of Energy called Cyber Informed Engineering. Um, there's a strategy out. There's a new implementation guide. Um, you know, I'm using the words informally. The, these words do not appear in the strategy, but you know, informally, the strategy is positioned as you know, positioning managing OT, managing cyber threats to OT systems, to you know, control you know, industrial computers that, that control power grids, that control pipelines. Managing cyber threats to those computers is like a coin with two sides. One side of the coin is cybersecurity teach engineers about cyber threats, teach them about cybersecurity. You know, there's nothing new there. We've been singing that song for 20 years. The other side of the coin is engineering. And this is in a sense what's new. I mean, the engineering profession is old. The techniques that we're talking about are old. But, you know, these are powerful techniques that have not been used consistently to address cyber threats. And they, and they need to be. Concrete example. Um, if you are a technician maintaining a boiler, Think a six-story boiler, a massive device. You've got five of these devices in a large power plant. That This is your job. Eight hours a day, you are calibrating the instruments, replacing the instrumentation that's failed. You've got the gamma ray testers to, to you know, do the in-situ corrosion detection and measurements. These babies, you know, these, these boilers are your babies. You work eight hours a day inside of the kill radius of a worst-case boiler explosion. If one of these boilers blows up, you and everyone else nearby dies. How would you like to be protected from a cyber attack that overheats the furnace under one of your boilers? Would you prefer a mechanical valve where, you know, there's if if the if the steam pressure becomes too high, it forces a piece of steel against a spring. The spring deforms, the steam escapes, and there's no explosion. Would you prefer a mechanical valve, or would you prefer a longer password on the computer controlling the furnace? Most of us would prefer mechanical valve or three because these things are mechanical they do wear out they you know there's corrosion there's issues that, that that can occur with them in a sense though it's the wrong question the right question is uh, you know the right answer is i want the three mechanical valves and the longer password on the boiler and a boatload of cybersecurity beside it again Managing cyber threats to physical operations is positioned as a coin with two sides. You don't pick one side of the coin or the other. You use the whole coin. And we've been neglecting 
the engineering side. We've been neglecting engineering grade protection. What is engineering grade? Well, the, the mechanical valve is engineering grade. There's no CPU in it. It behaves the same way, in a sense, all the time. It Yes, it fails. It has, you know, bathtub curb failure modes. It tends to fail, you know, these devices on average tend to fail more early in their lifetime. When there's manufacturing defects that show up, they tend to fail more later in the lifetime when, uh, you know, corrosion and other aging effects show up. And they tend to have a very low failure rate, but non-zero, you know, in the middle of their lifetime. You can model you know, the, the failures in a sense are deterministic. You can model the failure rate mathematically. You can do math on the safety. This is what we expect of, of the engineering profession when public safety or worker safety is at risk. You know, what is the opposite? What is IT grade uh, protection? Well, imagine Imagine that the engineering profession has <clears throat> um, invented a new way to build suspension bridges. I mean, we all hopefully have heard about the, the 1940 disaster, the Tacoma Narrows suspension bridge, one of the world's first really big, really long suspension bridges, um, had a harmonic frequency. A stiff breeze came along, started the bridge oscillating, and it tore itself to pieces. You know, the engineering profession learned that they have to consider harmonic frequencies in the design of their future suspension bridges. They've applied that, that learning consistently ever since. Imagine that the profession has figured out a way to build suspension bridges at one third of today's cost. I don't know, using carbon fiber or something. Um, the problem with the new design is that it's riddled from one end to the other with harmonic frequencies. People walking across the bridge can start it oscillating and, you know, almost enough to tear itself apart. And so the profession has said that, you know, that's unacceptable. And they've designed active vibration dampers into the bridge, hydraulic dampers. You know, there's, there's computers controlling the dampers. There's AI controlling the computers. The bridge feels rock solid because these dampers are actively counteracting the, the vibrations. How happy would you be driving to work every day across that bridge? If you knew that the design engineer hoped that if there was a cyber attack on the AI controlling the dampers, hoped that we could detect the attack before it crippled the AI. How happy would you be no, you know, driving across that bridge if you knew that the design engineer hoped that if we detected it in time, we could scramble an incident response team fast enough to prevent compromise of the AI? How happy would you be knowing that the design engineer hoped that if we failed <clears throat> and the, the, the attack crippled the AI that we could restore the functionality of the AI fast enough to prevent disaster. Hope is not what we expect of the engineering profession. We expect bridges that carry a specified load for a specified number of decades in a specified operating environment with a large margin for error. This is what we expect of the profession. You know, the profession has powerful tools, but think about it. Where is the, uh, where's the overpressure valve in the NIST cybersecurity framework, in ISO 27001, in the industrial 62443 cybersecurity standards? These tools don't exist in those standards. Those standards are for cybersecurity, not for engineering. So this is the new thing. Use powerful tools, the engineering community has to manage physical risk. Use those tools consistently, systematically, in addition to cybersecurity to improve, you know, to address cyber threats, as well as the threat of earthquakes, crimping output valves on the boilers and other physical scenarios. So that's the latest thinking. Um, oh, what have I got here? Here we go. Um, I've written, you know, my third book, to fit into that thinking where I, you know, I was talking about engineering grade solutions, but what it talks about is network engineering. Cause think about it. When that overpressure valve engages, what happens? Well, the steam escapes, there's no explosion, nobody dies. This is all good. And we shut the power plant down. This is a threat. If the power plant's big enough, this is a threat to national security. Really? Is a power plant a threat to national security? Well, this is the legal definition of critical, of the word critical in critical infrastructure. Okay, it's a legally defined term in you know, many regulations and laws. Critical means critical to the nation. And we just turned it off. 
We don't want that. How can we prevent that? Well, if we want to prevent a cyber attack turning off the power plant by tampering with the safety systems, we have to prevent that attack getting into the, the power plant in the first place. This is what network engineering is about. It's not used everywhere. We're not saying, uh, you know, replace every firewall with something stronger. What we're saying is at consequence boundaries between a network whose worst case consequence of compromise is unacceptable and a network whose worst case consequence of compromise is, is a business compromise, is a business consequence, it's lawsuits, it's money. At that consequence boundary, we need something stronger. I've got, you know, chapter five in the book uh, talks about uh, lots of different ways to do network engineering. The single most common way to do network engineering is a unidirectional security gateway. This is the stuff that Waterfall produces. This is why I know about this stuff, why I care about this stuff so much. Um, it's deployed very commonly at the ITOT interface. The ITOT interface, the connection between the business network and the network that controls the physical process, that boundary um, is the, the single most common place we see unidirectional gateways deployed to prevent deterministically engineering grade prevention of attack propagation into the OT network. How's that possible? The gateway, the, you know, the NIST 882 standard defines a unidirectional gateway as a combination of hardware and software. The hardware is physically able to move information in only one direction. The software makes copies of servers and emulates devices. What does all that mean? Well, physically able, if you look under the hood, there's a circuit board on the left with a fiber optic laser, a transmitter in it. There's a circuit board on the right with a receiver you can send through that you know, orange fiber on the front, you can send from one circuit board to the other, but it's not physically possible to send anything back. There is no laser in the receive circuit board. And so this is engineering grade unidirectionality. We can send information out to the business so the business can profit from access to the information, can schedule maintenance, can optimize all of these business processes with access to the information without the risk of attack information ever entering the OT network. All cyber sabotage attacks are information. If no information can get back into the industrial network, no attacks can get back ever. It does not matter how clever the attacks are. Um, and the software makes copies of servers. You know, if we have a database on the left um, that is sort of the repository of all data that we need to share with the business, the software logs into the database typically once a second. It's configurable, asks for everything new, gets back, what, 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes of data, converts the data to the weird one-way formats and one-way protocols, pushes it through the strange one-way hardware, and on the other side, logs into an identical database. If it's Oracle on the inside, it's Oracle on the outside. If it's Pi on the inside, it's Pi on the outside. Inserts the data, and now all of the data that anybody on the business network needs is available in the enterprise Pi server or the enterprise Oracle. You log in and you ask for it normally. You, you don't need to send questions into the industrial network anymore because all the data that's allowed to be shared with the business is out there on the business network already. So um, that's sort of the latest thinking. Um, Cyber-informed engineering says, let's use engineering tools in addition to cybersecurity. Network engineering uh, is positioned to protect reliability as well as safety, because a lot of cyber informed engineering is focused on safety and unidirectional gateways are the most common tool that we see deployed as network engineering. And, you know, a, a couple of words about waterfall. We've been around for 15 years. We're deployed all over the world. Uh, we invented the unidirectional gateway. We're all about OT security. We've got a whole family of technology that is network engineering. That's what I had for you. I hope it's useful. Thank you, Andrew. It's always nice to hear you. I know I appreciate for uh, coming here and spending your few minutes here for as part of sponsoring this workshop. It's and, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, participants will have a chance to win uh, Mr. Andrew Ginter's book uh, this afternoon. We have uh, during our break session, there's a, a quiz, a Kahoot quiz. So I, I urge you to participate in that uh, discussion. Thank you, Andrew.